it's 25. We're getting, we are getting old. We're getting so old. Uh, but I mean, cl classic Kevin Smith. I gotta say, uh, this is my copy. It's the tenth anniversary DVD extended. Right. One of one of the best uh, Easter movies out there. I'm just gonna say it. I'm gonna. Oh, is that that's a new guy? That's the Arrow one with like, look at that thick as a d on the back. Like all the contents, it's crazy, man. So they to to have Arrow be like, oh, we'll do that. Like that made me feel relevant for the 25th anniversary. Like they are now shoulder to shoulder with Criterion and stuff. So they were like, we want to do something comprehensive. They even put the TV bad dub on there as well, the TV cut with, with Jay's voices. Half the time it's Jay and half the time it's literally a guy who was in the sound engineer booth because Jay didn't show up for his looping appointment three times and finally they were like, look, just throw that guy in the booth. And then he wound up doing the voice and that was aired on ABC. So it's it's pretty damn comprehensive. The fact that we're still talking about it 25 years later, like I, I, I'm overjoyed about it. You gotta remember like when it came out, nobody liked this movie and I was told you're bad and it flopped and my career was over. So the fact that 25 years later, people still care about it like means everything, but it's a mind bender. You know, like I just remember coming to grips with the death of my second movie. Like that's, it's a big deal, man. Like I, when they open, we open, I've told the story many times, opening weekend, Jim Jacks, one of the producers, calls me on Saturday to give me the box office grosses because we didn't have the internet. He had to like call in and a company collected the grosses, I guess Universal's company, and then gave him a, an idea, a rough estimate of what we did on Friday. So I said, uh, how do we do? And he goes, we did $400,000. And I was like, on what screen? And he goes, that was on all of the screens. And we were on like 500 screens. So I was like, what, what does that mean? He goes, it's done. It's, it's over. And I remember being like, do I owe Universal $5 million? Like, I don't have that. Like, what happens in this situation? Clerks had cost like 27 grand and made $3 million at the box office. So easy math there. Like Mallrats made two million at the box office, cost five million. So I was like, "What happens to that remaining three? Am I on the hook for that?" I had no clue. Mercifully, you know, Universal has long since made their money back on it because slowly over time, it got embraced. Like when we came out, we had this beautiful Drew Struzan poster. Drew Struzan, one of the greatest uh, artists of all time, particularly poster artists in our industry and stuff. He's done the classics. He's done some of the greatest. He did Mallrats, and it's a gorgeous poster. And now that we know what Mallrats is, it's, you know, it's even more stunning. But when we released the movie, that poster didn't help sell that movie one iota. Like, it, it looked like a magazine cover. Most people didn't know it was meant to look like a comic book, didn't know the movie was based in comic book culture, didn't care. Comic book culture was not on anybody's minds in 1995, man. Like, you know, we'd had the occasional Batman movie, but even those were kind of like, I think in 95, we had just done Batman Forever. That had done well. But comic book movies weren't a thing. You would have a comic book movie every once in a while. So much so that when you watch Mallrats, like Jay literally, and he does Wolverine, Brody has to explain who Wolverine is. Like, he's doing the Wolverine uh, Berserker attack with his adamantium claws. Something we would never bother doing today because everybody knows so the movie came out spoke to nobody at the box office um like so much so where the opening weekend killed the movie like we were out of theaters by the following thursday so mall rats had like one week of life then it went to like dollar theaters and stuff but the whole game was over pretty quickly and then i spent years distancing myself from mall rats it became my whipping boy joke it you know the way that i talk about yoga hosers now where i'm like well don't believe anything i say i made yoga hosers. that that that's just a variation of the mall rats jokes i was telling from 1995 to 2005 until so you're like it was your green lantern like ryan reynolds will always will always have that punching bag to come back it, it was and then like in by 2005 the film had become kind of what it is today but then it caught a lucky break after that but like i would still make jokes about him be like well mall rats flopped and then i would have people enough people not just didn't happen once but enough that this became a stereotype people would be like that movie didn't flop i own it on dvd and i'm like those two things 
have nothing to do with one another. I was there. I remember it flopped. And then you remember the filmmaker's the only one that remembers that kind of shit. 10 years in, it was just a movie that a bunch of people were like, oh my God, I watched it on cable. Oh my God, I watched it with my friends. Oh my God, I have this DVD. Like, I, I remember the first time I saw it, I was at my friend's house, his brother was watching it. I said, what is this? Because they mentioned Wolverine, and I know who Wolverine is. It spoke to a, a pe bunch of people who were just about to find their power. You know, Mallrats happens a minute before YouTube breaks wide. And suddenly, people could get together and talk about comic book movies and ref use comic book movie dialogue or movie dialogue to relate to one another the same way I did with my friends and that's all I was depicting in Mallrats. So Mallrats like found its audience over time and I had to stop making fun of it because people would be like, that's your best movie, bro. You know, and suddenly I realized that like it's, it found the people who wanted it, who needed it. The people who were like, I am like Brody. Like we didn't get him at the box office, but we got him at home. And then slowly over time, it became kind of what it is. Then we got this incredibly lucky break with the explosion of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Because suddenly a Stan Lee cameo became de rigueur for every one of those movies that made almost half a million to a billion dollars. And anyone who had tri movie trivia was like, oh, he was in... Mallrats, like Stan Lee was in, he did that cameo thing in Mallrats. And Brody was a character who in 1995 was fringe. 2020, Brody is the internet. He's everybody. Like he's, he, you know, when we made Mallrats, you know, we presupposed a movie, we were putting forward a movie where everybody loved comic books and, and people knew who Stan Lee was. That wasn't the case in 1995. Now, 25 years later, that's exactly what the world is. So the movie, not by any virtue of the fact that I was a prognosticator or I'm talented, the pop culture landscape shifted in such a way that Mallrats looked prescient. A movie that was like dismissed and disregarded and even by its filmmaker suddenly became like prophetical. Suddenly it was like, oh no, finger on the pulse or whatever. Years later, they make Captain Marvel, and then Stan does the exact same thing himself, where he's like holding up a Mallrat script, and he's like, "Oh, I don't know if you ever heard of this guy Kevin Smith, but he he made a movie called Mallrat." Like it was it was weird. I was in in 1995. I was in a position to be like, "Ladies and gentlemen, Stan Lee." And years later, Stan Lee became so f huge that he was able to be like, "Ladies and gentlemen, Mallrats." Like it. it incredible how the world shifted and benefited Mallrats, almost like biblical in a way, uh, but at least in my world and stuff. So to be talking about it a quarter of a century later, like the movie that early in my career we tried never to talk about. Are you kidding me? During Dogma? Do you think I ever mentioned Mallrats once other than to be like, oh, well, I've grown up since then. Now Mallrats is the movie that buoys my specious career. Like at the end of the day, it's like, oh, well, well he made mall rats. So, you know, he can stay. You know, I don't belong in pop culture anymore. I'm not doing anything current. My finger's not on the pulse. But because of mall rats, I earned this chairman emeritus position. Like, you know, like, you know, every election they roll out some f is like, he's been right for every election since Carter. I'm that guy in movies where they're like, he was right once, exactly once, about Stan Lee and comic books. So it's nice. Whatever puts fuel in the tank at any point in my career, I'm happy to have, man. But Mallrats, I never would have seen come. But I mean, you, you know, you're a guy who you take your art, your pop culture seriously. How dark, how dark a time was that for you after it didn't live up to those expectations coming out of Clerks? And, and how did you emotionally rebound from that? Uh, it was... It was trying, I'll be honest with you, because, you know, Clerks, I was completely overpraised, where people are like, he's, he's a boy wonder, he's a flavor of the, it wasn't even flavor of the month, I got to enjoy it for a year. Mallrats was 180 degrees from that, stark opposite. For every great review that someone gave us on Clerks, the critic turned on Mallrats to be like, ew, you know, like, this is, and the general tone, if you could do a, a Rotten Tomatoes top line of all the reviews, was this, this, this is what you do. We put you in this position after clerks and this is what you're gonna make. How dare you? 
like it was seen as an incredibly uh, steep fall from, from clerks. So there was a year, eh, let's say six months, where things were very dark. Like before Mallrats died, I was writing Chasing Amy as a high school comedy. Very different than what it would eventually become because Jim Jacks, our producer on Mallrats, was just like, we went to see Clueless together and he was like, oh my God, let's do that with your Chasing Amy idea. Put it in high school. They got lesbians in high school, don't they? I was like, they will now. And I started writing it. But, you know, after when Mallrats tanked, suddenly the direction of Chasing Amy was never going to be antic or mall rats like or high school. Suddenly I was like, I'm retreating to my pedigree, which is film, independent cinema. I'm going to make a serious movie. I'm going to make a film. I mean, that's how we d differentiated in those days. Like Clerks was a film, mall rats was a movie, Chasing Amy was a film. And so making Chasing Amy absolutely rescued my career and Mallrats became essential in the redemption narrative, right? Like he started with Clerks and then he disappointed us with Mallrats, but now he's back with Chasing Amy and Chasing Amy is even smarter than Clerks. So it served a function early on. Like if at first it hurt, like I remember I was uh, dating my girlfriend at the time, Kim Lochran. She was teaching undergrad teaching at um b there's bc and bu which one's the catholic one uh bc maybe, I think. maybe bc I so know. she was like she was a student but also a teacher so she was overseeing a class and before we weren't going out at this point um it was like we were on again off again for like 12 years and stuff but at this point we were like good friends but we weren't dating so she, before Mallrats came out, she was like, can you come to my class and talk about like clerks and Mallrats and stuff? And I was like, oh, absolutely. I had to go to speak to her class the Monday after Mallrats tanked. And so me and Mosier drove to Boston and gave like for these poor 25 kids, the most despondent and depressing talk about the future where I was like, look, just why bother trying? Because we tried and Things don't work like the you know you didn't want to you don't want that you don't want to join this industry. The high, I, mean, totally. the I was like high, none of the, the, none of the kids, pretty low. They weren't even trying to get into the business. I I was just blanket like telling them life sucks and you're gonna get disappointed and it ain't always clerks. And these kids were like, who is this man? Like you know I wasn't even like who I am today. So it was it was it was dark, man. There's a you know Premier Magazine. Remember old Premier Magazine? I yeah, I interned there. Did you really? Yeah. I, I found a collection of them recently, man, going back to the very first Dragnet issue. But they right. used to like do poll quotes and stuff from like people that said stuff. Um, that one, the quote they pulled from me was like on some, you know, lecture circuit after Mallrats, where I said, um, I, spent, I spent like the last uh, few months with, or no, I spent the last weekend with a pile of bad reviews in one hand and a shotgun in the other, you know, trying desperately not to end my life or something very dramatic like that. Um, but it was weird. Like nobody, there's no course on like, uh, so your, your first time film has been picked up and you're an overnight sensation. Nobody teaches a course on that. They definitely don't teach a course on so you've had your sophomore slump, you know, so there was that, that concept existed, like sophomore jinx, um, you know, the second film not being as well received as the first and going into it, there was a fear that that would be the case that like, what if they don't like it as much as clerks? That fear evaporated because it became, well, it's a flop. So they definitely don't like it as much as clerks, but nobody's seen it and you've just lost a studio $3 million, the same studio that gave you Breakfast Club and Blues Brothers and Animal House, which you love, you lost $3 million for them. What are you going to do? You know, so it was, it was definitely, you know, at, at my life is, I've never been truly depressed or had true darkness, but that was definitely a, in my career, a dark moment, especially uncertain because I was like, well, what happens in this instance? Do I get to do this again? Like, it's not like Universal was like, hey man, so what do you want to do next? Like the only conversations we'd had were about Mallrats 2 and that died the moment Mallrats died. 
So at that point, nobody was knocking on my door and stuff. Like most of my career, it's been very self-generated. People don't ask me like, hey, we want you. Like people court, you know, great filmmakers like JJ and, and Chris Nolan. They're like, what do you want to do, man? Me, I've just always, I've always been like, well, I'm going to do this. There have been times, I'm not crying like about my career. There have been times people be like, what do you want to do? But generally speaking, if nobody's asking, what do you want to do? It's no excuse not to do it. So I just generated. So even though our, our, my career, and I always include Mosier, um, Mosier's career as producer um, felt like it was over on the day that after Mallrats debuted, I was like, well, we know how to make a small movie. Like, you know, we did it. That's how we got here. So let's just make, like, we'll make Chasing Amy. We'll make this very serious, hardcore indie flick and whatnot. And nobody can stop us from doing that. You know, since nobody was knocking on our door being like, what do you want to do next? The future was oddly wide open. You know, once you've hit rock bottom, like there's nowhere to go but up. So we had the tools. It's not like, you know, there were 10, 15, 20 years between Clerks and the next indie film I made. We'd only had one moment in time where we went and made a $5 million movie, which was Mallrats. So my skill set, if I had any ever, was still you know, in indie filmmaking. So the pivot to Chasing Amy made sense, was easy, was a, like, to me, the smartest thing in the world. Cause I'm like, look, this at least gives us a chance to rebuild. If I had gone knocking on another studio's door to be like, uh, hey, I just made mall rats. You want to give me a job? Like, I don't think anybody would have listened. Like nobody was playing Moneyball in those days. You know, the early days of the Marvel Cinematic Universe were built going like, what directors have done well, but are currently in movie jail because their latest movie didn't do well? I was never getting that call or nothing. So the Chasing Amy pivot saved it. And then Mallrats really became a punchline and Mallrats became a punching bag. And Mallrats became like the go-to joke where I could, you know, uh, kind of slap myself down. And like, I remember at one point, the, the line on Mallrats was like, it was a $5 million casting call for Chasing Amy because Jason Lee, Ben Affleck, Joey Adams all came right out of the Mallrats cast. But it was, it was dark and it was a little scary, man. Um, but not scary because I'm like, uh, oh man, they'll never let me work again. Scary because I legit honestly didn't know and still don't to this day if I owed Universal three million bucks. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody tells you, nobody says. The president of Hollywood doesn't sit you down and be like, you f***ed up. You owe us, you know, it's we'll, not. We'll, we'll email them for a statement after this. We'll right? find out. We just didn't, just, this, this kept still owe you some, some money. <laughs> yeah. We just need to know, we just need to know. We, we skipped like right past the prologue and went right to the epilogue. Uh, I do, I want to, we're going like Tarantino style. I want to rewind for a second mm. and go back to the very beginning for the Genesis. Okay. Yeah. So you're coming off clerks, little black and white comedy. You shop for like $27, right? Your local convenience store went on goes on to become this independent film sensation. You're only like a year or so removed from being a clerk yourself. After that success, going into Mallrats, wh where's your head at? In a great place. I live in New Jersey still. You got to realize when we, um, Mallrats happened the same minute Clerks happened for me as well. So I'm at uh, Sundance 1994, and we had just won the Filmmaker Trophy for Clerks. And we're at the after party and uh, John Pearson, who wrote Spike, Mike, Slackers and Dykes, a wonderful book about the indie film world. Um, he was our, our um, producer's rep. He introduces me to Jim Jacks. And he's like, this is Jim Jacks. He runs Alphaville with Sean Daniel. And I said, I know Jim Jacks, man. I, I seen his name in Raising Arizona, one of my favorite films. I know he did Tombstone. I know he did Tremors. I know he did Days and Confused, man. And I was happy to meet the guy and stuff. I was like, how are you? And he goes, I'm great. He's going, I loved your movie. I tried to buy it, but Miramax got it first. I said, you wanted to buy it? He goes, yeah, for Universal. He's going, we would have remade it in color. He's going, and you could have kept 75% of it. And I said, what 25% wouldn't have made it? And he goes, nobody f***s a dead guy in a Universal movie. I said, fair enough. I said, I'm glad it went to Miramax because I don't want to remake it and stuff. He goes, well, what are you doing next? And I, without thinking... I said, I'm doing a movie. I want to do a movie with you. And he goes, with me? I said, yeah, I want to go to Universal, man. They've made all my favorite movies, man. I'm, one of my favorite movies in the world is Animal House. It was made there. And he goes, yeah. He's going, all right, what's your movie? I said, Mall Rats. 
And he goes, what is it? And I go, it's clerks, but in a mall. And he goes, I want that. He's going, what's going to happen is Disney's got your movie now. So Disney is because Disney owned Miramax at that point. He's going, they're going to fly you out. And you're going to sit down with Hollywood pictures and touchstone. And he's going, they're going to ask you to pitch your things because you're their new, their new guy. He's going, you pitch them, whatever, but you save mall rats for me. You come to universal and I'm going to take you up to the black tower. and We're going to pitch that. We're going to make that movie. So I said, all right. And so that was at a party at Sundance before we even left in the same day that like I won an award and we'd been picked up and like, you know, everything was like crazy good and stuff. So I went home after Sundance and I cont continued to work at Quick Stop until August. So from January to August, I was still at Quick Stop. I would go to film festivals. So like any film festival happened, I'd fly out, but then I'd come home and I'd go back to work because I was not convinced that this film thing was gonna be real. Like, you know, I was afraid of being a flavor of the month, if that. And so I was like, you know, this job is real. I know what I, what I make at Quick Stop, I can count on these dollars and stuff. Like, I'm gonna hold on to this as long as I can. And I held on to it until August of that year, and then it became, I mean, you know, it wasn't all altruistic. Everybody in the world who wanted to interview me wanted to interview me at quick stop while I was working. So, you know, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't strategic. I wasn't like, you know, Ooh, this is how I'll get a lot of press, but it didn't hurt that I was there. And so the Miramax publicist would be like, well, you know, the New York times wants to speak to you. When are you available? And I was like, well, I'm working from, I'm three o'clock till 10 30 every night this week. And they're like working on what? And I'm like at quick stop. And they're like, you're kidding. And I was like, no, I'm, I told you I was going back to work. And they're like, can we send the New York Times to Quick Stop? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And so they sent everybody, camera crews, like TV shows, newspapers, magazines. They all, you know, we were, we were 45 minutes outside of Manhattan. So anybody who did journalism in the 90s in Manhattan made the trip down to Quick Stop, ET, like everybody. And not the extraterrestrial, entertainment tonight which my mom was very impressed by. And they came down and interviewed me and stuff. And so, but it became untenable where it's like, you can't run the register if you're talking about how you made a movie there and stuff like that. So by August, I was like, all right, I guess I'm done here. And so we went to st start shooting mall rats. Um, let me see. It was, we were done by Easter. So it was the top of 95. So in January, we head out to Minnesota. So from October to January, I'm still living in New Jersey, still hanging out with my friends, got my same friend group and stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm early, let me see if it's 1994. So I'm 23, 24 at this point, 24 by the end of the summer. Um, so I'm filled with righteous integrity. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, you know how film Twitter is now. That's how I was in my twenties. Like, you know, what is good and what's not, and this is crap. And these are hacks and this one's an auteur. Oh, I, and so there was no way I was going to like sell out, man. You know, like I was in, I was all integrity. I was not going to Hollywood. Yeah. We were making a movie with Hollywood money, but like I'm living right here in Jersey where I stayed up until 2002. So I, I stayed real connected to the same place that created clerks and, you know, created me and, and that there was, you know, your friends are your friends and they, they'll definitely, I had good friends who would like give me props for what I did, but they were not like obsequious or like, Oh my God, you're so much smarter than us now or something like that. So it, the friend group stayed real. And so I stayed real. There wasn't like an, there was an influx of new people professionally, like suddenly, you know, uh, I had a publicist at Miramax and working with, you know, these people, you meet a lot of the same people at the festival that you meet later on doing press as well. But generally speaking, my friend group remained, this, remained the same and, and it remained the same, like from pre-clerks all the way and shit till now. So like, you know, Scott's went off and become a director and stuff. But generally speaking, we were a pretty tight knit group. And because of that, I, I never felt scared about the future. Um, you know, there was concern going into our relationship with Universal over Mallrats because there was a lot of, um, it wasn't condescension, but there was a lot of like, well, 
we make movies here, you know, and we have been doing so for, you know, decades. And, you know, me and Scott were like, well, we make movies too. You know, we made one called Clerks and everyone likes it. And they would, their kind of rejoinder on that was always like, well, that's not really a real movie now, is it? Like, so they weren't dismissive. I don't want to paint them as but they were like, you know, like this kind of like, you know, if you were like, oh, I would like to edit the movie myself. And they're like, why? I'm like, well, I edited Clerks. And they're like, well, that's not really a, a movie now, is it? It's got two cuts in it, you know, right, shit like that. Right, right, right. So there was a lot of like, we want you because of Clerks, but cool your jets. You only made Clerks, you know what I'm saying? Which also kept me in check as well, to some degree. I couldn't get a lofty head because I was always getting looked down at from under the glasses, kind of like in this way. So all of that, the gestalt of all of that kept me, for lack of a better word, very grounded. The biggest fears that I had going into Mallrats were whether or not I could get Jason into the movie. Like Jason Mewes, of course, Jay was written for Jay. They didn't want him. Universal really didn't want him at all. Universal wanted their top two choices for Jay because they were like, that's a great part. And I'm like, yeah, it's written for the guy who is that guy in real life. And, you know, they'd seen Clerks and they're like, well, he's rough. He, you know, you could get a real good actor. So the two kids that were the, their first two choices, Universal, were Seth Green and Brecken Meyer, both of whom went on to create and work on Robot Chicken for like years together. Two wonderful actors, two kids I know, the great, great guys, who I remember during the casting process would sit there like and talk, speak to me in very guilty voices going like, I don't want to play this guy's part. He's going, that guy's a genius. I love that movie. And he's like, so fresh. And I'm like, I know, but they want us to see other J's. So like, you know, do your best. Like we were complicit in not wanting them to get the part. Like even Seth and Brecken, who were like, you know, I want a job. were like, I do want a job, but I don't want to take that guy's job. Because actors liked Jay, not because he was, because he wasn't an actor. He was so raw and a force of nature. So they were like, I don't want to take that guy's part. That's bad hoodoo. So when we, uh, we had this amazing casting director, Don Phillips, who, you know, should have a star on the walk of fame. He was the guy who found uh, Sean Penn for um, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. He cast that movie. He's the guy that discovered um, Matthew McConaughey by way of Richard Linklater because he cast Dazed and Confused. And he's the guy that discovered Jason Lee because he cast Small Rats as well. So Don Phillips uh, is our casting director. Um, he's, you know, he's worked with the studio and his bread is buttered at the studio. But, you know, you're, when you're a casting director, of course, you and the director are in lockstep. So he was like constantly being pulled in two different directions because I was like, Don, you know, Jay is going to play Jay. There's no two ways about it. Like that's like the part was written for him. He is Jay in real life. He played this part in Clerks. You know, and Dom was like, look, I get it. I get it. But we have to be prepared for when the studio says no. Because Kevin, that's what the studio does. He's going like, you know, you think you're friends until they pull on the chain and it's their money and stuff like that. So you couldn't slip one by these cats. There was no back door or anything like that. Jason just had to audition like everybody else against people for his part. So at the, we had this uh, pizza party thing uh, that Don Phillips, he set up, I guess they did it on Days of Confused as well. And the idea is you bring in multiple actors for each part. So we had three J's, three uh, Brodies, three uh, Brandies and stuff. And throughout the day, you know, you're mixing and matching and, the idea is they'll round robin it. Like studio's there, everybody involved is there. And so they get to see your three choices and then they narrow it down or, or the performances start narrowing it down. So like in, in the case of Brody, there was a guy going into the day who I was sure was going to be cast. And he's not, I, I wish I could be like, and that kid was Leonardo DiCaprio. It wasn't. But he was in movies. He'd been in a few flicks and smaller parts and stuff. And we went, we saw him all through the audition process, me and Scott Mosier. And we were like, this is it. Oh my God, this guy's totally Brody. And Jason Lee came in through Don Phillips because Don Phillips was like, 
you got to do me a favor. And I was like, okay, what? And he's like, uh, Gay Rabisi, she's a manager in this town. She represents Vonnie, her son. She represents Marissa, her daughter. Marissa was in Dazed and Confused. I said, who? And she goes, the redhead girl. I said, oh, she's great. And he goes, okay, she used to date a kid named Jason Lee, who's a professional skateboarder or something, and now he wants to be an actor. So Gay represents him, and he asked if I could let him come in so he can meet you and just see what this process is like. He's never auditioned for anything in his life, but she's got to start him somewhere, and I like Gay, and I'm trying to do her a favor, do you mind? And I was like, no, absolutely not. Bring him in, sure. We might as well say hi. So he came in for a meet and greet where you just sit down and talk to him. And me and Mosier liked him, like Jason Lee. Like, I remember being like, so they tell me you skateboard. And he's like, yeah, I, well, I retired. And I was like, what do you mean? You retired? Because he was like 22. And he's like, well, I've been professionally skateboarding. I've been skate. He goes, I've been skateboarding at a professional level for nine years. So I'm just done with it. I've retired. And now I'm looking into acting. And it was so like almost precocious, like where you're like, kid, what do you mean you retired from skateboarding? You're in your early 20s. But he had this vision where he's like, well, now I would like to be an actor. So we just kind of liked him. And so Don Phillips afterwards was like, thank you for seeing that kid. You don't have to have him back. And we were like, no, bring him back in. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah, we, look, we, me and Moj don't know anybody out in Los Angeles. And he's pretty real. So like, bring, we like talking to him. Bring him back in. So he came back in and auditioned for TS because all the boys that first came in auditioned first for TS and all the girls auditioned for Brandy. And then we started going, okay, you might be a good Brody and so forth and so on. So he came in and auditioned. Don Phillips is like, what do you think? And I was like, I, I like him. I was like, I don't think he's Brody, but like, I, I, I don't think he's TS. I said, maybe bring him in for, for Brody read. And so Jason Lee came back. And then after his audition again, like we talked to him for a while, then he did his performance. And then, you know, Don Phillips is like, what do you think? Is he coming back? I said, yeah. And he goes, really? And he goes, yeah, I don't think he's Brody, but like, he's got something, man. Like, just, you know, might as well keep him around. Like, he's good. Plus, he's a good dude. And, and meanwhile, we're seeing alternate J's, you know, which is like breaking Jason Muse's heart. And so we get to this pizza party thing. So there's a couple uh, Brodies, and there was a guy who we thought was going to be Brody. But then I've never seen this happen before or since. Like, game was on his stick, it was all his, the part was his, and it slipped away throughout the course of the auditioning day. So much so that at one point, like, I remember talking to him, and I was, like, ill-experienced. I didn't know, I've never been through a casting thing or anything like that, but I was like, I feel bad for this kid, he's floundering. So I was like, like, I don't know how else to say this, but, like, you, you, you got, you got, you're, you're losing it, man. You gotta, you gotta, like, get it back and stuff. And that was probably not a thing an actor wants to hear, like, in that moment. But Jason Lee just kept impressing over the course of the day. And he had this very specific delivery. Like there was a term in the script, black mass. At one point, Brody was like make, make lying about spending in his house. And he was saying like, I hear they hold black masks, so black masses over there. And the way he said it, he held it out. He goes, black mass. And it just like made me laugh. Like I was like, that's really sweet. He slowly rose throughout the day to the point where the studio liked him, I liked him, Don Phillips liked him, and they were like, offer him the part. At the end of the day for the round robin with, with uh, the J part, um, the studio was like, look, we see you're very passionate about your friend and we get it. We see that he was very funny in the audition. We still don't think he's the guy, but we're gonna let you do this. You take him out to Minnesota with you because we were doing a month of rehearsals before we started shooting. You fly him out to Minnesota on your dime. We're not going to put him up there. So, you know, if you want to put him in your hotel room, that's fine. Um, and he's, he, he'll shoot for the first day. And then we're going to look at his dailies. And if we don't like his dailies at the end of day one, he's getting fired and you're bringing in either Seth Green or Brecken Meyer. And that was the deal. And I was like, okay. So I told Jay, I was like, look, man, like, you got to be stellar. Like, we rehearsed. He integrated with the group so quickly and stuff. He became real tight with Ethan and Jason and stuff. So it, it, it really worked out so much so by the first day we did his, his first shoot, which is about three days into the movie, was Jason Muse's first day. And it was backstage with Trish the Dish where he gives her the tape. So it was a real low-impact scene. Like, you couldn't really, it wasn't make or break and but there was a bunch of like, do it, Doug, and all that. That was the same day. 
So we shot all that footage and then it got, you know, it had to get processed in Minnesota and then um, put onto, you know, VHS and then FedExed back to California. Nowadays, you just throw it online and you could watch it on a download. And shit, but this was a process. So, you know, we shot with Jason and then they wouldn't let us shoot with him for two days until they got the results back from his first day of shooting. So when they finally got the tapes and watched them and stuff, they called us up and they were like, okay, you can proceed with them. And Jason, only then did he start getting paid to be in the movie. So he earned that, part, which is, it's so crazy that he had to earn the part that he was literally born to play. Like without him, the J character never exists, but he eventually got to play that part. Who are some other people? Because you always hear, you know, the parallel universe casting stories for this movie, like like any movie with like a big ensemble, a lot of young actors. Who are some other Who are some other actors that were there at the the, the pizza party, as you as you called it? Like, was there anyone? Familiar? Not at the pizza party, um, but well, like Amanda Pete was at the pizza party, and I remember Amanda Pete was really mad because she was New York. We cast her out in New York, and they brought her out. You know, the pizza party was in Los Angeles. So when she got out there, Shannon was the other um, uh, Renee. So it was down to Amanda Pete and Shannon Doherty. And I guess at the end of the pizza party, if I remember correctly, Amanda felt that it had been a waste of her time because she was only a stalking horse for Shannon Doherty, is what she felt. Um, I didn't think that was the case. Like, we didn't know that Shannon was definitely going to do it, and the studio actually wanted to see her act. You have to remember, Shannon had left Beverly Hills 90210 and, you know, was had a bit of a reputation as being a bad girl and stuff. So the studio wasn't completely sold on her um, being in the cast. So they wanted to see some choices. And I remember, like, since I'm, you know, from New Jersey and I was at that age where I'm like, Los Angeles, man. Like the fact that she was irritated about, she's like, what a waste of time. They flew me all the way out here for nothing. Like I sympathize because I'm like, I know and we're stuck in Los Angeles. Like this is bull man. Like I, she had a East Coast ethos that I really respected where she was pissed that like, you know, why'd you bring me out to this hell hole? And I wasn't even up for the part is what she thought. But I honestly felt like, and so did the studio, that she was in contention for the part. Um, who else? She, she, Amanda Pete was at the pizza party. People that didn't go to the pizza party, like, um, uh, what's her face? Um, uh, oh my God. Um, Reese Witherspoon. Reese. Yeah. Reese was at, we saw Reese for audition. And I remember we so, so excited, me and Mojo, because we loved Man, Man in the, Man on, Man in the Moon or Man, man on the Moon. I think it was called Man in the Moon. The one, not to be confused with the Andy Kaufman. Biopic. This was a very small Southern movie, coming of age movie um, that she was really good in and stuff. And um, we met her for the meet and greet before you do the audition. Like there's two phase process. You meet, Don would bring actors and actresses in for a meet and greet where you're just like, so how are you? And then if we got along, then he'd bring them in for an audition. So we've been looking forward to Reese, but it never went past the meet and greet. Because she uh, was, she, again, I'm 24 at this point, almost 25. And, you know, just film Twitter integrity rolling through these veins before film Twitter is a thing. So Reese Witherspoon, like, is talking about clerks. And she goes, oh, I was also in a convenience store movie, SFW. It's the same thing. And that really turned me off where I was like, SFW was not, that's not clerks. Like what? Like, you know, and that was kind of the deal breaker for us. Uh, that wasn't the only deal breaker, but that was, that was a big one. Alyssa Milano. I remember like, um, Don Phillips was like, we're bringing in Alyssa Milano and me and Mosier were like, what? From who's the boss? No way, man. And she was the exact opposite. She was like our favorite person that came in for the meet and greets. Like she was interesting, funny, smart like just a person like just like jason lee where you're like i hang out with this person like 
you're 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 a outlier here in Hollywood and like that. Um, and I can't remember if she she didn't go to the pizza parties, but not because she wasn't like good. I think she was just. I think she might have been like, I'm not doing this movie. I don't know, but I don't remember saying no to her. But I don't remember her being at the pizza party. So, and we liked her so much that it seems weird that she didn't like wind up in the cast. So it must have been like she was like, I'm doing something else or something. But I remember being way impressed by her and stuff. Um, who else came through? No, I'm telling you, I always like want to be like, oh my God, like all of young Hollywood, but we never saw like Leonardo DiCaprio or Tobey Maguire or anything like that. I got a name for you, Adam Sandler. Was he, was he somebody you talked to? No. He was Saturday Night Live famous at that point. And also he had done Billy Madison. While we were in post on Mallrats, Billy Madison posters were all over the Universal campus. Like when you go eat at the commissary, there was a poster for Billy Madison. So he was already a movie star in his own right. And I remember like, like I remember going up, uh, like at one point <laughs> talking about um, like Don Phillips was like, we'd like to bring in Ethan Hawke. And I'm like, Ethan Hawke? The dude's like 40. And um, <laughs> I said that in an interview and they printed it. And then in parentheses afterwards, they're like, Ethan Hawke is really 30 years old or whatever. Like I had upped his age. Like to me, I'm like, well, these characters are young and Ethan Hawke is older than hell. But like, if you look at Ethan Hawke in say, um, what was that movie he did? The slacker movie. Um, oh, uh, uh, he directed, uh, no, no, Ben Stiller directed it. Reality Bites. Reality Bites. So Ethan Hawke essentially playing a character that probably, you know, age-wise would have fit right in with the Mallrats crew. But in my head, because Ethan Hawke had been working for years and years, I was like, he's too old for this movie. But really, he wasn't too old at all. But I remember they suggested, like, uh, Ethan Hawke, and they also suggested um, Mike Myers. And I was like, Mike Myers? Like, he pretends to be a young person in Wayne's world, but, like, that's already, he's already like too old and stuff. But also those were names like, it's not like he, like Mike Myers was in contention or was like, I'm interested in this movie. Mike Myers had his own shit going on. This was just something Don Phillips was throwing out. So instead of going with like more well-known people, Don convinced Universal and Jim Jacks that it should be more like dazed and confused. Let's find some stars. Let's, you know, mint some people. Let's take some people who've been in smaller roles, move them up, and then find some brand new people. So because of that, it worked out with the casting. Don Phillips, like still to this day, they should give him, not for our movie, but just for all those movies where he discovered somebody like Sean Penn still working today. Matthew McConaughey's still working today. Jason Lee's still working today. Like he had an eye for real talent, man. Well, yeah, and speaking of, I mean, this was this was two years before Matt and Ben blew up for Goodwill Hunting. Uh, Affleck was like, he was a young working actor at the time, right? Uh, tell, tell, me, tell me about the first time you met him and, and you know, how you feel. I mean, he, he can play a perfect douchebag, let's admit it. Like, how, tell, tell, me, wait, tell me, give me your first impression. One of my favorite stories in the world about Ben Affleck is about everything before I met Ben Affleck. Um, cause I hadn't known him. He was in, you know, mall rats and Ben goes back in the business. He's, he was a kid actor on voyage of the Mimi. So he's been around for a minute and stuff. So he's coming in, I, you know, but I'm not, it's not like, Ooh, Ben Affleck's coming in. Jim Jacks, you know, our producer comes in to me and Scott and he goes, Ben Affleck's coming in today. And we were like, who's that? And he's like, he's O'Banion in Days of Confused. And I was like, oh, the asshole with the paddle. And, and he goes, yeah. And he's going, but I don't want him in this movie. I said, why? And he goes, because he's got a potty mouth. He's going, he was on Days and Confused. And Days and Confused had a very high count in the script. But he kept throwing in after He's got a potty mouth. He's going, this small rat script already has too many fucks in it. He's just going to add a lot more fucks. I don't want him in this movie. And I was like, fair enough, man. Fair enough. So... Ben comes into audition and we, um, he didn't have a meet and greet. He just went right to audition. I don't know why. 
I think because Don, oh, because he was in Days and Confused. And, and also, you know, he knew Don, he knew Jim. I guess he didn't know that Jim didn't really have an in for him. And had a, you know, it was just kind of like, don't cast me. But I guess because of that, he didn't have to do a meet and greet, went right to audition. And Hollywood Reporter or Variety had just run a story that morning about a script that him and his buddy had written and sold to Castle Rock called Goodwill Hunting. And in the story, it was noteworthy because there were a couple actors who wrote a spec script that got picked up by a very important company, Castle Rock. At that point, Rob Reiner doing like some of his career best work at Castle Rock. Castle Rock also, I think at that point, the home of Seinfeld as well. Like they were on a f***ing roll. They're huge. So that's notable, but also notable is the fact that they made $800,000 for the script. Like, almost a million bucks so he comes in and you know he's like hey how are you i'm ben i'm like hey man congratulations i just read in the trades goodwill hunting like they picked up your spec script and he was so caught off guard man he was like what how did you know that and i was like well it's in the trades this morning he goes you read the trades you're young and i was like well it's our business we're, we're supposed to know what's going on and stuff i was like you made almost a million bucks from that script what are you doing in here you don't need the money and he's like, well, I still want to act. And I was like, all right, fair enough. Let's, let's go to it. And he acted. And, you know, right, he came in, of course, reading for TS. And as soon as he was done, we liked talking to him. And Jim was there, but Jim was very standoffish. When he left, you know, Jim was like, what did I tell you? Potty mouth. How many times did he curse? And I was like, I, look, I don't think he's TS, but I like him. I think he could be like Shannon Hamilton. And, and Jim goes, no, God damn it. He's going, the f count is going to go through the roof. And I said, Jim, but you're telling the wrong guy. Like, he's, telling I the, him he's, telling 30, he's telling the 37 dicks guy over here. Exactly. I'm like, that's almost like a sweet promise. So the idea of like him being potty mouth always bemused me. No end. I liked him enough. I was like, let's bring him back to Shannon Hamilton. Ben, like right away, was just like, oh man, I got to play the bully. So when he came in for the audition, he was vocally on his part, not in a really hardcore, like your movie way, but he's like, you know, man, I just want to do good work in this business, but anyone sees me as like a bully. And now I'm a guy who just wants to have butt sex. He's going like, I don't know what this is going to do for my career. Like, so he was very, he was so like self-effacing. And the fact that he would talk about himself as having a career and he would talk about his fan base, but like in a very, like like fun way he knew he had no fan base he knew he had no audience but he would pretend there was an affleck audience all the time and stuff we just liked him me and mojo thought he was like so charming and shit and so he was honestly of all the people we saw hands down the best for shannon hamilton he carried a menace to him but he also knew comedy he could pull that off and stuff and so J jim begrudgingly let us cast uh, ben and when i finally got to tell him that he was cast ben was just like how did I get past Jim Jacks? And I was like, what, you know about that? He's going, yeah, I'm Days and Confused. He was always calling me a potty mouth. And I was like, he called you a potty mouth before this. So he joined us and he was working on Goodwill Hunting the whole time. So Mallrats, you know, if you watch the movie, Shannon Hamilton's not in it, never seen. So he would come to the back offices, the offices, we all had our offices at the mall. So wherever you saw a fake store like Burning Flesh, the tanning parlor or Rug Munchers, behind those doors were our production offices. So Ben came into my office one day and he was just like, hey man, like I'm not shooting for four days. Would you mind if I went back to California? Cause you know, we're working on this Goodwill hunting thing. We got a meeting with Meathead, who's Rob Reiner. He played Meathead and all in the family. He's going, we got a meeting with Meathead. I was like, holy crap. I said, you should go. He's going, yeah, but we shoot on, you know, four days from now. I was like, well, just be back. Like, go and you be back by the time you shoot, right? And he's like, yeah, I can do that. And he was like, ah, I said, go. And he's like, thanks, man. So before he leaves, he left me a note, a thank you note that was just like, uh, hey, thanks for letting me go to this. I've been having a really good time making this movie. Like, you know, it's been going well. Just like a real, like, I, something you never get. You don't even get that today. You don't even get a text or an email going like, hey, thanks. It was just so cordial. I was like, this kid's raised right. So like, I liked him a lot. He's also fun to have on set. He's fun to sit around behind a camera with. He's incredibly smart, as most people know by now. He's incredibly smart and incredibly funny. So he was an asset, you know, to have on the movie. And one of his biggest frustrations was 
you know, I was real tight about the script. Like back then I was like, you do every word that's written in the script. Nobody ad libs. I'm the writer and the writer is king and the script is the Bible. So, you know, Ben is much funnier in real life than the character he plays in Mallrats and any of the lines that he was given in Mallrats and stuff. So he would constantly try to ad lib or mad lib as we called it, which irritated young, you know, film Twitter me, where I was just like, well, how dare you try to ad lib with this stuff? But he's got an ad lib that makes it like into the movie. One of the only ad libs that made it into Mallrats, which is him going when he gets arrested at the end, when, the, when uh, Jason Lee goes, that girl's only 15. And Ben goes, 15. He goes, oh, come on. I thought she, no, he goes, 15. I thought she was 36. Not a line in the script at all. And then he follows it up with, come on, guys, tell me you wouldn't have popped her. And that was also not in the script. So it was such a funny line that even me as staunchly like my words are nothing, was able to be like, I like this guy. That's how he, why I wound up writing Chasing Amy for him. Because I was just like, he's so f good and he's funny. And behind, off camera, when he wasn't playing a bully, like in Days Confused or an asshole like in Mallrats, he was like Charm City. Like, I was like, you should be a leading man. He's like, why don't you tell people that? He's going, why don't you stop casting me as bullies and stuff like that and tell people that. So months later, after Mallrats had died, I was dating Joey Adams at the time. She was in Tampa making a show called Second Noah. So I would go out and visit her. Her and James Marsden were on that show. So I'd go out and visit her and she'd shoot like most of the day. So when she was shooting, I would be in the hotel room writing Chasing Amy. And so one night I called up Ben just because I, I was pretty deep. I was about 40 pages in with him in my mind as Holden McNeil based on who he was on Mallrats on set, but not on camera, off camera. So I call up Ben and I'm like, hey man, uh, you know, we both first, like he's real lovely. When he, when he left the movie, he left me a, I don't know if I still have it. Let me see if I've had it here for the longest time. Maybe it's in here. Maybe I put it away. Yeah, it's not here. He left me this note that was sitting here on my desk for the longest time. And I hope somebody didn't steal it. Um, but it's the note where he literally says, and I've teased him about it for years. And he goes, I didn't really mean it. In the note, he was like, I had a great time making this movie. I know you're coming out to Los Angeles for post-production. So he goes, you should look me up. We should hang out. I'm a good guy. And that's literally a quote. He goes, we should hang out. I'm a good guy. And I found it so charming. He left that in a thank you note when he left the movie, when he was wrapped. So when I did come back to Los Angeles to edit, you know, work on post-production, edit the movie with the editor, Paul Dixon. Like I did call him up and we would hang out and stuff like that. And so I liked him so much. I was like, this guy should be the lead in the movie. So I started writing Chasing Amy for him. But I realized that I hadn't asked him if he would be into that, especially knowing that like at one point, like he'd have to kiss a dude and stuff like that. So I reached out to him from the hotel room in Tampa to be like, hey, man, um, what you up to? And he's like, no, what's medicals? What are you doing? And I was like, I'm in Tampa with Adams, man. She's making a TV show. Um, and he was like, second Moses. I was like, second Noah, you're close. And he goes, uh, what are you calling for? And I said, I just felt like it's time to tell you, I'm the next movie I'm writing you as the lead. And he goes, finally, somebody with wisdom, you know? So it was based on mall rats hanging out with him on set that I wrote the part for him in chasing Amy and based on hanging out with him on mall rats, I would spend the next what, six, seven movies with them like it went mall rats chasing amy dogma jane son bob strike back jersey girl clerks too so seven movies in a row um with ben in them and stuff and and you know it, it's it goes to show you that like the chief criticism against him that he was potty mouth only endeared him to me more like you know he does have a I don't want to smirch his good name and stuff, but like he's an exquisite cusser and, and it was nice to have one on set. Nothing wrong with that. Well, you, you and Joey obviously got along, as you mentioned, you guys, you got, you guys dated after the film or did that, did that start like after long? it didn't start until afterwards. Like I remember palling around with Joey all through mall rats. Like I, I loved Joey before I knew that I loved Joey. I loved Joey cause she was so snarky and, 
and acerbic and biting, you know, back in the days you would say like, she was one of the guys, like she literally sounded like Scott or Jason Muse, like her sensibility was very similar to ours considering she was from Arkansas, you know, that was also fun. She had things you could pick on her for and you had things that she could pick on you for. And we spent the whole movie making fun of each other. Like, you know, and I didn't honestly did not realize that like that's affection like that. I mean, I, I was doing it affectionately, but I didn't realize like, oh, you like this girl. Like we behaved like kids in school when kids in school like each other, where they just all they do is kind of poke fun at each other and stuff. So I would, you know, I would say like we'd be in rehearsals and I'd be like, can you do that line again? But this time say it like you're not in dazed and confused. And she would be like, well, it's tough to because Rick was such a good director you know, and shit like that. And so it was playful throughout the whole shoot and stuff. She was always very self-effacing as well. I love anybody that can make fun of themselves. And she would make fun of herself for having such a small part in the movie. She would always be like, you know, if you cut all my scenes out, you could probably still make this movie without you. I said, no, we need you to have that conversation with Brandy. She's like, oh, that's it? I'm exposition? Great. And you got to realize this was someone who thought she was going to be playing the lead. She thought she was going to be Renee because she knew Jim Jacks like through Days of Confused. And Jim Jacks was constantly telling her like, I'm working on this new movie with this kid now who did Clerks and you're going to play the lead. And Universal didn't care for that suggestion. They wanted somebody bigger. So suddenly Jim couldn't deliver on what he had promised her. So Joey's beginning, like Joey's relationship with Mallrats, the beginning of it, is fraught with peril, disappointment and anger because she thought she had the part. And then suddenly Jim was like, you don't have the part. You have to audition for the part. And then she didn't get the part. Shannon uh, Doherty got the part. Then we had no Gwen. And I was like, why don't we reach out to Joey Adams? And like Jim Jacks was like, oh God, no, don't start this. And I was like, well, I mean, you wanted her in the cast. We love her. She's fun. Like, let's, let's see if she wants to play Gwen. And so Jim reached out and, you know, Joey was like, don't with me like I've already went through this once like if you're offering me this like yes I would take it and then Jim had to explain to her that she was gonna have to audition and Joey like to her credit rather than being like you should all go f yourselves she came in and auditioned as Gwen and like knocked it out the park and so boom she joined us but she joined us you know with a f chip on her shoulder and rightfully so you know she was kind of pissed about how the whole casting thing had went down not that dissimilar well hers was more like her you know remember when i, I was saying amanda pete was mad she got flown out and stuff i understood joey's thing more than i understood amanda's thing because i felt like at one point a guy told her that she had the part and then didn't bother telling director and you know until later on and then the studio was like well you didn't tell us and we didn't agree to that either so like he kind of shot himself in the foot. So, you know, it, she started the movie like, ugh, it's a mall rats picture, you know, because it had given her so much heartbreak and stuff. And then our friendship on, while we were making the movie had a lot of jabs in it. So it would be like constant referencing to that from both sides where she would just be like, you know, I thought it was bad when I had the lead and then they yanked it away from me. She's going, but your direction, now that's bad, you know, like that. So by the end of the movie, like, you know, she was my favorite person in the cast. Like I, I just, and not like in a way of like, oh, she's a girl and I like her. I just, I loved being around her. And when she left, when she was done shooting, we shot all the Gwen scenes. Uh, when she was leaving Minnesota, like I drove her to the airport. Like I was like, we have to move everything because I have to drive Joey to the airport. And they're like, why? That's what the Teamsters do. And I'm like, because she's leaving. So we went out to eat at Denny's and bullshit and stuff. And then I brought her to the airport. And while we were at Denny's, she was like, I was like, what are you doing when you get home? And she goes, um, I've, I've got an audition like uh, for this movie that I think I might actually get. And I said, what is it? And she goes, Biodome. I said, who is it? She's like, Pauly Shore. And I was like, you can't do that. Joey, you are in mall rats. Don't you understand? This is going to change your career, man. Don't go doing some Pauly Shore movie before mall rats comes out and changes your life. Like mall rats is a film. 
Biodome is going to be a movie. You don't want to be involved with that. So mercifully, she didn't listen to my advice. She took Biodome. Biodome made like 25 to $30 million, helped her career. Marat came out to $2 million, did not help Joey's career one iota, except for the fact that, you know, I was so into her and I thought she was so talented and that when I was, you know, chasing Amy, I was like, it's her. It's based on our relationship. It's written for her and stuff. It's a movie for her to shine. But it, it begins in Mallrats. And, and what a trial by fire she had to go through to get into that movie of all movies. And she doesn't even make the poster. Like, she would always make fun of me for, like, I'm not on the poster. Nobody gives a f about me in the where are they now. She was like, can I shoot something? Like, I remember when she saw the movie, because we were dating by that point. She was like, can I shoot a where are they now? You mentioned Shannon was probably like the, the biggest name at that time, right? Tell me, like, she's coming off Beverly Hills, now it's Uno. Like, what, what, what's the vibe you're, you're catching from her on set? Shannon got the movie Greenlit. It's that simple. Without Shannon Doherty, Mallrats never gets made. Um, we didn't have a strong enough cast for Universal to give us Greenlight. And mind you, it wasn't Universal, half Universal. It was Gramercy Pictures, which was a, a partnership between Universal and Polygram Filmed Entertainment. So it was them going, we're going to make small, lower budget movies. And so uh, Gramercy put out Days Confused. They put out uh, The Usual Suspects, if I remember correctly, Barbed Wire, Mall Rats, the Mystery Science Theater 3000 movie. Um, you know, quirky stuff before they had like focus to do indie stuff. So um, uh, uh, Gramercy kept using this phrase. And it's, it's funny, it haunts me. Like, I thought it would be something I'd hear for the rest of my life, but it was only ever on that movie. Blinking green light. They were like, this movie has a blinking green light. And they're like, does that mean we got a green light? They're like, no. Blinking green light. Because I guess in racing, the light flashes before it goes solid. And when it goes solid, that is your green light to go. So throughout the process, we had a blinking green light on Mallrats, cast dependent. And Gramercy was very clear, like, if we don't get a cast that we can market, if we don't get two people we can sell the movie on, we can't make the movie. Even, you know, the budget was five million bucks. So Shannon was the big gun. Like, and she was coming off of uh, 90210. She had left the show about six months earlier or something like that. I don't think she'd done her next thing yet. Like, Charmed hadn't come along yet. So this was the first thing after 90210. And, um, she was a huge get for us. So I remember she came in for the meet and greet and she was absolutely lovely. Her too, I got along with super well. Um, but she was like famous. Uh, the nice thing about her was she didn't like act that way, but she, you know, she was famous. Like 90210 was the show. She was everywhere. And she wasn't just famous for her performance in the show. She was famous for her off-camera antics as well. So when she came in, you didn't know who you were going to get. You thought maybe you were going to get the tabloid version of her who would fight with paparazzi and stuff like that. But instead, she came in like utterly likable, fun. She also had an acerbic edge, also self-effacing, very, very self-aware of, you know, all the talk about her and stuff and happy to present that she was not that person. Um, so I liked her right away. I liked her even more when, I, when Universal was like, now that is a name. We can hang a marketing campaign on that name. And so Shannon's the one that got us greenlit. And when she came out to shoot, she had a German shepherd straight from Germany that responded to German commands, like, you know, Schnell, Essen, like that. She needed because she was like, harassed like she was stalked by photographers and then people as well and you know she i remember I, I have very vivid memories of her walking through the eden prairie mall with this glorious german shepherd and the mall people like managers being like we we can't have pets walking through the mall and we were like do you want to tell shannon doherty that she can't have her dog be our guest. And, you know, she, she was, uh, let me see, at that point, she stayed the whole show. Like, you know, some people like Affleck would fly back to California. She stayed throughout the whole time. Um, she was a real, like, cheerleader for the movie and very into doing fast dialogue. One of the fastest paced 
scenes of dialogue in anything I've ever done is her and Jason Lee in the elevator barking at each other. It plays like a, like a speed of a Howard Hawks movie. Not, certainly not the quality, but the speed of a Howard Hawks scene back and forth. Um, and then what else? What else about Shannon? She, like, um, her, she got to keep her wardrobe. Like, I remember that. Part of her deal, you know, she didn't make a lot of money on the movie. The movie was very low budget. But one of the things that her agent had uh, negotiated for her was she got to keep her wardrobe, all of it. So she went shopping with a costume designer and, you know, picked out clothes that she would wear after Mallrats was done and stuff. So um, I remember at one point I wanted to put a Degrassi jacket in the movie. Um, I was a huge Degrassi junior high and Degrassi high fan. And I reached out, I was up in Canada and I'd re they had a thing, a TV show called Speaker's Corner, where you go and you put a loony or a toonie into this, like what looked like a phone booth, and it had a camera, and then for two minutes you could say whatever you wanted, and then they put together a TV program of all these people popping in the booth and saying, like, this is what I think about this. So I popped in the booth to be like, hey, man, I'm, I made Clerks. I'm a huge Degrassi fan. We're making this movie Mall Rats, and I want to put a Degrassi jacket in it. I reached out to Playing With Time Productions, but they won't get back to me. Does anybody know how I can get my hands on a Degrassi jacket and stuff? So I told my, uh, the wardrobe folks, you know, like I couldn't get the Degrassi jacket. And they're like, we could just stitch Degrassi into her jacket. And I was like, oh my God, that's great. Do that then. Especially because the Degrassi jacket was like cheap, like, you know, nylon or whatever. This was a really nice suede jacket that was part of the wardrobe. So, you know, they put... Degrassi high on the back of the jacket. And she's like, why is it stitched on my jacket? And I was like, Be well, because, you know, I don't, because I like Degrassi. She's like, Kevin, I get to keep this wardrobe. She's like, I got to wear this jacket. It has Degrassi on it now. Oh, you ruined it. Um, I don't know where that jacket is, but I don't think she did keep it. I think she might have left it behind. Are you guys, are you guys still in touch today? I know, I know she's, she's, she's going. <laughs> Absolutely. I sent her the script for... Twilight of the Mall Rats, uh, the last two versions of the script, which she absolutely loves. She plays a huge part in. Uh, and, you know, she's going through, of course, uh, fighting her cancer battle. But, you know, Shannon, I've always known and I've known for 25 years as a fighter. And clearly she's not given up. She's a wonderful person, got great spirit, great heart. But, you know, she's she's a fighter. She's she's going to be with us. Good to hear. Uh, I, I know. I know. One of the things you, you you've had to reconcile with is like you know obviously like the, the role of Harvey Weinstein like early on in your career. This was the this is what was the one movie that he was not involved, with, right? I mean, you told the story about about how it came to Jim, but how did he, how did he respond to that at the time that you were uh, not I even going to? What is this the question? Nobody ever asked. They didn't care. Like when we made Clerks. There was, you know, an understanding that they, Miramax was going to make Dogma next. Like, you know, they're in for Dogma. I had talked about it. They're like, that sounds great. I had a script. They could read it. Mallrats, since I met Jim Jacks and pitched to him, and we were like, me and Mosier were like, Mallrats is not a Miramax film. You know, Miramax makes Clerks, makes Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction. Mallrats doesn't feel like it. If they had had the genre division, Dimension, which they eventually had, Mallrats would have been a wonderful Dimension movie. But at the time, it didn't feel like it had a place at Miramax at all. So we set it up at Universal and nobody ever said anything. Like we didn't have an overall deal with Miramax. They bought Clerks, but it was just one transaction. That was it. So we went off and made Mallrats with Universal. Then afterwards, during right before it came out, like two months before it came out, we showed the movie to um, John Gordon. John Gordon was, um, he was an exec at that point at Miramax, but we knew him when he was an assistant at Miramax, like during Clerks. So we went out to dinner or lunch with him in the city and, and he was like, how was the movie? How was it making, working for Universal and stuff? And I was like, it was interesting. It was fun. I had to change some stuff and blah, blah, blah. And we had the movie, so we watched the movie, and he loved it. And he was just like, what are you going to do next? And he's like, you should be at Miramax. He's going, that's your home. Like, that's, you know, Clerks happened there. He's going, and this is great, man. We should have made Mallrats. He's going, but, like, why don't you set up your overall deal here? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, hang your shingle. And I was like, I don't understand. And he's like, 
just you make an overall deal. So all of your movies, the first look is Miramax. So you could wind up making all of them here. You'd have a home studio. And you know, Miramax mid nineties, man, was the absolute gold standard on its way to becoming, you know, platinum. Like, you know, this is minutes before the Oscars started rolling in, but like, you know, Clerks was the same year as Pulp Fiction. So they had broken through the $100 million barrier with an art house film. So, you know, me and Moj were like, you know, we loved John Gordon. Um, we loved Mark Tusk, who was the guy who found Clerks for Miramax. These were young people and stuff that worked there. So John was like, I think I could sell this, man. I think I could sell you guys setting up an overall deal here. And he did. So we wound up doing an overall deal with Miramax before Mall Rats came out. Because I remember Jim was a little upset. You know, he was just like, what the? At first he was upset before the movie came out. Then when the movie, when Mall Rats came out and died, he, he wasn't upset. Jim was like, it was smart what you did because now you have a home and they're gonna make your next movie. He's like, Mallrats would not have made, uh, Universal would not have made your next movie after Mallrats. But at first he was pissed at me and Scott that we made a deal and went to Miramax. So Mallrats actually kind of made the Miramax deal possible only by virtue of the fact that John Gordon watched Mallrats and was like, you should have done it with us. There was no reason you couldn't have done it with us. And you should be doing all your stuff with us. What do you want to do next? And I was talking about Chasing Amy, but he also knew about Dogma. And he was like, you know you're going to make Dogma here. Just set up your deal here. And so Dogma, it felt like we didn't want to start with Dogma because we'd just come off mall rats and lost money and stuff. So we didn't want to be like, give us more money to make this religious fantasy. Chasing Amy felt like a real Miramax movie, felt like the move. So we went in with a budget of three million bucks and they were like, absolutely not. But we were already you know, signed up to a deal at that point. So there was no outcry when we went to make a movie at Universal. Nobody was like, oh man, we were small fish. And you know, there was no parade when we came home, but I made movies there for like, you know, from 1990, well first they picked up Clerks in 94. And then we closed our deal with Miramax in late 95 and then I left after Zach and Mary, which was 2008. So how many years is that? Five, like 12, 13 years. Um, and you know, and during that time, all the movies were made at either Miramax or the Weinstein Company. But when we went to make Mallrats, there was no, they never mentioned that movie, like ever to me. Um, even when I'd be out there like making fun of it, like I went to the Indie Spirit Awards um, 1996, I was a writer for the show. So they also let me present and I presented with Laura Dern. And um, before we even got into our scripted banter, um, I said, uh, hey, uh, while we're here in front of the entire indie film community, I just wanna take this opportunity to apologize for mall rats. I don't know what I was thinking. And the whole tent was like, ah, ha, ha, ha. And then we went on to our <laughs> Roger Ebert, like when he reviewed Chasing Amy, it was like Kevin Smith, you know, started with Clerks and then made a movie so bad that he apologized for it, you know, is now back with Chasing Amy. So he thought I was like serious. Like, you know, it was very tongue in cheek and stuff. I didn't truly feel like I had to apologize for Mallrats, but that was like early on in my, you know, let me get on Mallrats because it'll, it'll uh, raise my credibility in the indie film world. One thing I don't think we, we touched on, and you know, we, we got to be as comprehensive as, as possible here. Uh, you said you, there were things that Universal made you change. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what were a few of those things? Nina Jacobson, uh, who's a wonderful woman, and she's gone on to, you know, f have a huge career and stuff. Um, she made like the M. Night movies, and she's involved in something huge. Now, maybe the Hunger Games. I don't know. She went on to like f fame and like big projects and like that but back then she was a universal exec she was our universal exec <clears throat> casey silver was the head of the studio at that point she was one of the execs under casey so she had mall rats so in the script there's a scene where jay and silent bob are in the changing room um you know where gwen keeps getting changed silent bob's head goes to the door and through the wall and 
one of the changing room sequences was like you see Gwen changing. And by the way, the changing room sequences only exist because Jim Jacks was like, this is a teen titty movie. It needs titties. He, he rode that so hard. He was like, we're a smart porkies. That's what we're making here. I don't know where he got the smart pork part. And I don't know where he got the Porky's part, but that was the thing. Like script didn't have nudity in it or anything like that. Like if you watch the rest of the movies I've ever made, I, don't, I can't think of any nudity in the movies. This was a studio driven mandate um, as an executive mandate of like, it's an R rated comedy. It better have nudity in it and stuff. So I had to write in these scenes of silent Bob crashing into the changing room. And so one of the changing room gags was, you see Gwen getting changed and then you go through the wall and you see Jay and Silent Bob watching and Silent Bob is jerking off. You don't see it below frame. And then like um, all of a sudden, like uh, it hits the moment of truth and you see his O face and you see something jet up super fast. And then all you hear is ah from the other side. And then Jay and Silent Bob, go running from the changing room. And then every time we saw Gwen after that in the movie, she had matted hair, hair that was tightened up and matted, um, with the idea being like she got splooged on. Um, Nina, Nina Jacobson was like, you don't need that scene, Kevin. And you know, I was like, what do you mean, man? I've never seen that in a movie. And she's going, with good reason. She's going, nobody wants to see bodily fluids in a movie. She's going like, you know, it's just, it's, she's going, I know that you feel like you have to be true to an audience or something, but she's going, this is an indie film. We don't have to push the edge of the envelope quite so hard here. And she was like, you know, a scene like that, Kevin, and she was very sweet and explained it to me like I was a child. A scene like that, Kevin, she's going like, will turn some people off. She's going, and you don't want that when you're making a comedy. Like, don't you want to reach the widest possible audience? That's not a bad thing, is it? Like, isn't that what we're all going for? Reaching the widest possible audience. The way to reach the widest possible audience is to cut that sequence. And I was like, you know, you're absolutely right. She talked me out of it and I cut it. A Couple years later, uh, there's a movie called There's Something About Mary where, you know, bodily fluids in the hair is such a thing that it's on the f- poster. They marketed the movie with Cameron Diaz with a shampoo horn, you know, f- sticking out of her head. And I remember at the time being like, man, I could have been the first. Now, in 2020, I'm okay. Like, um, I, you know, I owe Nina Jacobson a f- big old thank you note to be like, thank you. You saved me from myself. Like Mallrats has an edge. And like I saw, you know, Entertainment Weekly today called it ribald. And, you know, yeah, it's definitely ribald. That scene might have taken it someplace beyond cute into like, oh, that's just, that's just unsettling. You know what I'm saying? So I remember being a kid and being like, man, they talked me out of it. And now that I'm an adult, I'm like, no, I'm glad she talked me out of that one. You, hit, you touched on this earlier, but uh, I do want to ask, I mean, just, just speaking of the, the, the late, great Stan Lee, uh, tell us your experience watching Captain Marvel, seeing him on that bus in that moment, that throwback. He's, he's got the Mallrats script. He's uh, 90s set. He's rehearsing his dialogue. I imagine that had to be uh, just a little bit special for you. It was fantastic. And I, I've said this before, and I like honestly mean this. I don't. And I hope people now know me after like 26 years enough to know that this is true. Like, I don't need an Oscar. If they want to give me one, like when I'm old and and they're like, you know, he's been around, like that's fine. But like, that's not the high water mark of my, of my business for me, of my, my vocation. For a lot of people it is, man. And I applaud them. That's great. For me, like a high water mark of my vocation was Stan reading the Mallrats script in Captain Marvel. Number one, movie made of over a billion dollars, which means more people saw the word Mallrats in Captain Marvel than have ever seen Mallrats collectively maybe 
since the movie came out. Um, number two, that matters to me. You know, like I like you know, the Academy's fine and stuff, but like I like being a member, but like whether I get a trophy or not, that don't matter to me. Being acknowledged in a fucking Marvel movie, they, that like that's huge for my brand, Kev. Like I could eat out on that. That that puts fuel in the tank. Oddly enough, even though that movie was set in nineteen in the mid nineties, ninety five, that gave me twenty nineteen relevancy right before we headed back out there with Jay and Silent Bob reboot, man. So it it was everything, you know. And, and when you when your business is you, like I'm in the Kevin Smith business, anything that makes the job a little easier is wonderful. You know, because generally it's Sisyphus. You're pushing the boulder up the hill, man. Like I've been around too long for people to give a f and I've been around too long for people to like be like, oh, he's a flash in the pan. So you become a fixture, like a piece of furniture or like that one painting in your grandma's house that you rarely look at or something like that. So when something like that happens, that creates a conversation that you didn't even have to work at creating. Suddenly people are like, oh, did you see your name? In, Mar in Captain Marvel, Stan was reading your script. New discussion, new relevancy, new stories are created, new poignancies. You know, suddenly in that moment, I was like, wow, back in 95, I shined and put a spotlight on him. In 2019, he returned the favor. Like, it helps you write the narrative, you know, uh, the ongoing narrative of your career, of your life and stuff. And like, for people that, you know, I've been active for 26 years, but not everyone's been following for all 26. You know, some people drop out of your career and be like, oh, what's he up to now? That was a real nice kind of like, he's still here. You know what I'm saying? Like a poke. It, it was just wonderful. So I, I love that. You know, people are always like, would you want to direct a Marvel movie? I'm like, no. But the moment they want to cast me, I'm there. Number one, they'll put me in that Camille shape, man, where you get rock hard abs and like that. And number two, I'd be in a Marvel movie. Like, I don't want to make a Marvel movie. That seems hard and it's for very talented people with a lot of patience. But being in a Marvel movie? Like, I can make a movie. I can make a Kevin Smith movie all the live long day. So if I have an urge to make a movie, that's the kind of movie I'm talented enough to make. But like being even referenced in a Marvel movie, I was like, oh. Like that goes beyond the dream of Kevin Smith who was like, I want to be a filmmaker. That goes further back to Kevin Smith who read Marvel comics, who watched Spider-Man and his amazing friends, who watched every uh, episode of The Incredible Hulk and like that. Like, it, it, it's, it validated my childhood, you know, it validated a movie that a lot of people on when it came out. Like, if I could go back in time to 1995, to that Saturday morning or Monday when me and Mosier are at Boston College and I'm like, don't even try, kids, what's the point? And tell them that like, bro, at one point, you're in a Marvel movie. And then, of course, I'd be like, Marvel? Like, they don't make, like, what? Like, that Fantastic Four movie that Roger Corman made? Marvel doesn't make comic book movies. And then when the present caught up with me, I'd realize how huge that was. Um, it, it's, it's everything. That, honestly, like, I can't overstate how much that meant to me. And I know that Stan didn't create it himself, but that Stan was the one doing it. That Stan didn't hear the idea and be like, I don't want to do that. Think of something else that he was just like, Ooh, let's do that. It means everything. It, it's, it warms my heart to this day. I love it. I love it. It's, it's, it's a beautiful moment for so many reasons, you know, from that, from that, from that aspect to, to the, the smile Brie Larson gives him, you know, of course it came out after he left us. Uh, it's a beautiful moment. Uh, finally, we, I mean, we got to talk sequel. You've been, I know you've been wanting to do some sort of sequel uh, for years now. Um, you mentioned you, you, you sent the scripts, uh, a couple versions to Shannon. Uh, wh where, where are you with it now? We've been taught, the good folks at Universal co-financed Jane Silent Bob Reboot. They had done the foreign side of the equation. So Jasper, who we worked with at Universal over there, was like, what do you got? We had a great time. What do you guys want to do next? And I was like, I, I would, you guys have something of mine that I've been trying to play with for five years. I would, now that we've done this, I would love to get a crack at it and stuff. So I told them, I was like, I want to do mall rats and I don't want to do the one that I've already written because I had a real like come to Jesus about it. When I was, um, I'm going to turn on the fan just because it's boiling hot. Um, when I was on the set of mall rats in 1995, Jim Jacks at one point were 
close to the close to rap. Jim Jacks goes, um, have you thought of a sequel? And I was like, a sequel? What are you talking about? And he's going, this movie's going to do well. He's going, so the studio is going to want a sequel. Do you have an idea in mind? And I said, um, let's do let's do Mallrats 2, Die Hard in a Mall. And he's going, you're kidding. And I was like, yeah, every movie does Die Hard in a plane and a building and a train. Let's do Die Hard in a Mall, like Brody becomes John McClane. And Jim was like, I love that. Let's do it. So years later, when I was like, ooh, I'm going to make a Mallrat sequel, that's the sequel I wrote. That's the one I was intending to make. Then we couldn't get it made, and then I hacked it up for parts, and the entire third act of that Mallrats 2 script became the entire third act of Jane Silent Bob reboot, including Iron Bob. He was meant to appear in Mallrats um, 2. So I hacked it up for parts. Then all of a sudden, the movie came back to life, where they were like, hey, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I want to do Mallrats. And I was like, okay, do I rebuild, you know, even though I've taken the third act for Jane Silent Bob reboot, do I tell the same story? How do I tell this diehard story now? And that's when I had this real, like, come to Jesus conversation with myself, where I was like, if you were a fan of Mallrats for 25 years, and then somebody had the temerity to make a sequel, and you were like, well, this I got to see. Like, how the f*** do you do this? And you sit down, and the movie you're presented is a diehard parody like that has nothing to do with mall rats really other than the characters names and stuff first you'd be sitting there going like were there diehard jokes in mall rats that i don't remember but then you'd be like oh this is this is old like why are you making fun of diehard this seems not very timely at all and it wouldn't have been because it was a joke from a set you know back that i made in 1995 so when i wrote twilight of the mall rats i actually wrote like a true Mallrats sequel. Mallrats 2 really wasn't, had the same characters, wasn't really technically a sequel. This plays like beat for beat exactly like Mallrats. Um, like scene structure is the same. You meet characters in the same order. The band comes together slowly, like stop making sense. Um, and we spend all of the time like at the mall and it makes sense. Like, and it begins just like Mallrats. Because Mallrats, like, uh, Nate Gonzalez, who does our artwork for Fat Man Beyond for the podcast that me and Mark Bernard do, um, he's a big Mallrats fan. So I gave him, the, like, the first few scenes that I wrote. And he said this thing that blew my hair back. He goes, what's Brody's arc going to be? And I was like, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? What do you, and he's like, what, what is Brody's arc? And I was like, well, what was Brody's arc in Mallrats? And then we started thinking about it, and I realized Brody had no arc in Mallrats. Like, Brody starts the movie as, you know, Brody, and then ends the movie as Brody. Nothing really changes. He doesn't grow and become a better person. He meets Stan Lee. Like, everything works out for him, and, and he wins. And, like, you know, I was like, oh, my God. I realized that's because all the movies that I was emulating, the characters also didn't have a character arc. Like, Bluto didn't become a better person at the end of Animal House. Technically, he becomes a senator, but I guess that is a better person. Well, not in real life. But like uh, Caddyshack, you know, Ty didn't become a better person at the end, nor did Danny. You know, he just won a golf game. So those were the movies that fed Mallrats, that and the John Hughes stuff. And, you know, John Hughes' characters definitely had more arcs. So Mallrats in its DNA, like, has a character who doesn't really learn anything. And so I'm like, if you're truly sequelizing it, can you possibly make that movie again? Like, would someone stand for a movie where the character starts at A and ends at A and a bunch of shit happens, but he doesn't really change? And then I'm like, do you even want to tell that story? You know, because then you realize, well, I'm 25 years on from the first version of this, first iteration of this story. I do have to give him a character arc. I was like, he does have to, Something has to happen with Brody. Otherwise, why are we taking this journey again? So the script wound up being a better sequel to Mallrats, a more honest sequel, like by definition. Um, and it wound up being much, much closer to what Mallrats was. For example, the movie opens with two people getting broken up with and they go to the mall. And, and it's structurally very much the same. There's a Stan Lee scene 
but of course we don't have Stan. But what takes its place is like, uh, it's, it's beautiful. It makes me cry when I read it, but that's not saying anything because I wrote it. But it's very poetic and very fitting. Um, so even that portion of the movie plays us in. The only thing that doesn't happen in the movie is no game show. Because I remember at one point um, I said to Nate, uh, I was like, you know, and then of course in the third act, there'll be another game show. And Nate was like, nobody watches game shows anymore. And I was like, dude, nobody watched game shows in 95. Like, believe me, I'm, it's, not, it's not like I've lost my head or something like that. But like, if it's Mallrats 2 or Twilight of the Mallrats, shouldn't it have a game show? And he was like, I don't think you need it. I think with like what you have in the third act, you're fine. So no game show, but everybody comes back. I can't wait. Uh, I, my, my goal was to go like as long as like the runtime of uh, Mole Rats. I, I think we did it. Did we do we, it? I think, we, I think we beat an hour and 36 minutes. I so, love the sound of my own voice so much. You'd, thought, you'd think I'd have been a politician, but no. I love this. I love the sound of your voice too, man. We have got to stick together, man. You and I, it's, I, ha, I love your sonorous voice as well, but it probably has to do with our names. It's a Kev thing. As long as you and I don't get COVID, we will be doing this again, probably next time in person. I hope so. I hope so. Good to see you, you man. Excellent. All right. We're, I know I'm still alive in this business if I'm still talking to you, Kev. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you later. Right. Peace.